I can be happy the rest of my life where the sin Dream of pictures I run in the night See us together chasing the moonlight my sin Thank you for allowing for that introduction. Awesome, thank you, Jim. You got one more for us? Uh, I will, sure, I'll do the one more and then um, sort of tag along as, uh, and hop in as appropriate if, uh, if needed, so. But hopefully you guys like this. This is uh, an old Tom Petty song called Last Dance with Mary Jane. Mama never was around. 
grew up tall, grew up bright. The Indiana boys on the Indiana nights. She moved down here at the age of 18. She grew the boys away. I was introduced and we both started grooving. She said, I dig you, baby, but I got to keep moving, keep it on. Let's dance with Mary Jane one more time to kill it, baby. Summer creeping in and I'm tired of this town again. I don't know, but I've been told you never slow down, you never too old. I'm tired of screwing up, I'm tired of going down, I'm tired of myself, I'm tired of these towns. But oh my, my, oh hell yes, honey, put on that body dress, buy me a drink, sing me a song, take me. I come because I won't stay long. Last dance with Mary Jane. One more time to kill the pain. There's pigeons down in Market Square. She's standing in her underwear, looking down from a hotel room. Not far, we'll be coming soon. Oh, my, my. Oh, hell yes. You got to put on that party dress. It was too cold to walk. When I woke up alone, I hit the last number and I walked to the road. Last dance with Mary Jane, one more time to kill the baby. And I feel summer creeping in, tired of this town again. Thank you very much. That was Jem from Acoustic 7. So he is our resident box musician. Thank you, Jem, very much for kicking us off this evening. Thank you. Uh, Thank you all. Thanks so much. That was great.
Um, so hi everyone, my name is uh, Michelle Ponge. For those of you that I haven't met yet, uh, I know we've got some regulars on here and some um, new faces, so please welcome. Welcome to our February box. We are thrilled to have you guys uh, join us today. Uh, we've got a full lineup and tons to get through and uh, some great exciting beers to taste. So um, just a few housekeeping notes. Uh, please keep your audio muted. Uh, you know, as much as we love to hear your dogs barking and the dishwasher and whatnot, it gets a little distracting. Um, and if you can, uh, turn it to speaker view just to kind of maximize your experience. Uh, if you have any questions throughout the evening, please use the chat box and I will happily uh, facilitate any questions. Um, if you are going to uh, promote us and, and chat with us, engage with us on social this evening, please use the hashtag uh, community craft box. So I just want to mention and highlight a few uh, people in the box. Um, as you guys know, we really work hard to promote uh, small businesses, uh, promote local, uh, promote Canadian businesses, and um, with your in security board ingredients in the box, we've highlighted a few um, businesses that maybe you weren't familiar with before that I'd like to tell you a little bit about them. So we've got Canadian made hard bite chips. Um, we have the avocado and lime and they have some really, really unique flavors and they're gourmet chips. They're sold at like Whole Foods and Nature's Emporium and whatnot. Um, we have Canadian, uh, the Great Canadian Meat Company, which has supplied your salami this evening. Uh, we've got Hot, Hot Mamas, which is from Aurelia and they do all kinds of spices. So they do like steak spices and all kinds of marinades and whatnot. Uh, the Oliver Corp, they're actually um, a small business based in Hamilton and they import uh, really, really uh, gourmet uh, olive oils and uh, vinegars and olives. So those are the olives that you're that you have with you this evening. Um, you actually have two different kinds of olives, one which is for the tapenade, which we'll make, like, make later, and then one which is for the board. Um, and then also for those of you that did purchase a, a board, um, this is made by a company called Williams Woodworking. And uh, this is a, um, a mom and pop company and they donate their, pro to, their proceeds to autism awareness. So uh, on top of them being beautiful boards, they're also a really great cause. Um, so I would like to introduce our kind of co-host this evening. Um, we have Chris Freeman, who is the head brewer and GM uh, from Collingwood Brewery with us this evening. Um, and then we also have Christine Kropp, who is a lifestyle blogger, baker and chef. So we're pleased to have both of them to help us uh, kind of bring this evening together. Um, so I should say that uh, the first beer that we're going to get started with, and I'm sure everyone's getting thirsty, so uh, feel free to open up your Collingwood Sunset Point, and we'll get started with that one. Uh, I'm going to spotlight Chris as he's pouring his beer and, and getting ready for us here. Um, so Chris Freeman from Collingwood Brewery, I will hand it over to you. Welcome, thank you. Thanks Michelle, uh, and thanks for uh, having the Collingwood uh, Brewery participate uh, in your box this month. Really certainly appreciate it. Um, good evening everyone, my name is Chris Freeman. I, as Michelle said, I am the head brewer here uh, and co-founder of the Collingwood Brewery. Um, so just first, just I'll raise a glass to everyone and say cheers. And uh, please take your first sip of your Sunset Point lager. And I'll we'll join you. <laughs> oh, please, this is my first time doing an online tasting. So please bear with me. Um, so first, uh, a bit about the Collingwood Brewery. Um, we have been open, we're coming up on seven years now. So we opened in May of 2014. Uh, around about the time when a whole bunch of other people also decided to open a brewery in Collingwood. So we were fortunate to be part of uh, a movement, I guess, um, a kind of a crest of a wave here in Collingwood where uh, we all opened our doors at the same time and kind of instantly became a bit of a beer destination. Uh, the industry here has continued to grow since then. 
So uh, my story as, as a brewer goes back uh, before that, several years before that, when I was kind of in a dead end office job in Toronto, but uh, an aspiring home brewer. Um, my wife gave me permission to go back to college and study brewing at Niagara College. So I was part of their very first cohort uh, out of the college, um, their first graduating class. Uh, I landed myself a job in Seymour Springs, uh, brewed there for a couple of years, made a ton of lagers and pilsners, uh, learned quite a bit, a uh, great place to work. And uh, during that time, I had, uh, had an eye to opening a brewery in Collingwood. So uh, I was a beer guy. What I didn't have was all the money that I needed to brewery. So I, I eventually hooked up with uh, three other guys, Art, Tim and Greg, who are also looking to open uh, a brewery in Collingwood. Um, long story short, uh, we found a, a great site here at the edge of town. And uh, over a couple years, uh, got uh, got all the zoning done and got the approvals done and spent uh, about 10 months actually building the facility, uh, which you can kind of see behind me. There's a, behind me. There's a, a little bit of uh, reflection there. So like I said, we've been open now seven years almost. Uh, we have, we're distributed all across the province in the LCBO, the beer store, and at bars and restaurants. Uh, we also have a retail store here at the brewery. Uh, we also have a tap room uh, and a patio. So um, it's been a bit tough as of late through COVID. We've definitely relied on the support of uh, locals and, and people like you who uh, are ordering their beer online and uh, through many groups as we were us. So it's, it's been a bit of a tough go, but uh, uh, we're, we're looking forward to opening back up. The first step, which we took uh, this week, uh, we were fortunate that we're allowed to open our tap room again um, and our patio as well. We have some nice heaters out there too, so people keep our guests warm. So, um, so that is on the go right now. Uh, we're definitely looking forward uh, to the summer, hopefully, uh, if, if we continue to open up. We uh, just finished building a huge um, event space here at the brewery. We'll be able to host uh, concerts, weddings, etc. Uh, many, many big things like that. Um, so we're looking, definitely that's a big, big upgrade for us. So, uh, one, one thing we've learned through uh, the, this, the, the epidemic and just being in this industry for the last seven years is that um, now with so many breweries in the, in the industry, we like as much as we have focused uh, on, our, on our own backyard, we really have to make this place a destination give people an experience, uh, especially with us. We're, we're a bit off the beaten path. We're kind of in an industrial area. So we're not on a thoroughfare uh, or a main road. So uh, we've, we've been working really hard to make, uh, to give people lots of reasons to come to the brewery. Um, and you're gonna taste a bunch of them tonight, actually the freestyle series. Uh, a lot of the beers that you're having tonight are from our freestyle series, which we really got rolling about a year and a half ago. Um, and there are small batch one-off series, uh, which box is full of. So uh, they're, it's great and they're a lot of fun to make. So. Um, so uh, I guess maybe we'll talk first about the Sunset Point Lager. Um, this is, uh, this, it took me a while to make something like this. Uh, I started out making <laughs> sales managers laughing at me because he was the one who convinced me to make this beer because I wanted to make all the, you know, fun stuff. Um, but uh, this is a very, very straightforward, uh, easy drinking lager, lager named uh, after Sunset Point, which is a big destination here in Collingwood. It's a beautiful park on the water where you can go down and swim and there's lots of family. So it's, it's a real, um, a really well-known landmark here in Collingwood. And uh, we launched this, uh, we first, this, the first iteration of this beer was called Good as Hellas. So I originally made it as, as a German style lager, um, but it caught on so well, we decided to bring it back and make it a full-time beer. Um, and we just, and it, it did get uh, the kind of, standard lager name just because it has a broader appeal. More people will understand what craft lager is uh, instead of um, and it's it's just it's become really really popular uh, especially at the front door of the brewery. Uh, it doesn't it's not out in the in the market yet on the LCBO or the grocery store or anything like that uh, but it is coming eventually. Um, so you can see it's it's uh, just golden it is unfiltered so you will see a bit of haze. Um, and you will, depending on how much, how much agitated your can when you poured it, uh, there might be a little more sediment in there, like a little bit hazier. But like I said, it's a very, very straightforward, easy drinking lager, 4.4%. Um, really kind of, this, these, these types of beers are actually the hardest to make. Um, make an IPA, there's, there's a lot of wiggle room. When you make an IPA, for, there's a lot of hops, there's a lot of alcohol, so you can fudge it one way or the other. But when you, when you make a beer like this, you really got to nail it. Um, so I like to think that I did, um, but uh, 
it's it's really just the, the there's just plain it's it's totally naked um it's just the malt very very delicate hop aroma so i really get a little bit of breadiness and graininess uh this the malt in this you know just when i talk about malt um i don't know how much everyone knows about brewing but when i refer to malt i'm talking about the barley uh, that we use in beer which is our sugar syrup. So we can use other things like malted wheat or malted rye uh, or corn or other things like that. But the standard generic name, uh, malt, is referring to malted barley. So this really is just, it features a 100% Canadian two-year-old barley all grown in uh, Western Canada. Um, and just, just a little bit of uh, European hops and German hops. Um, and it's like a very straightforward. Chris, we're getting some good feedback here. Sorry. Excellent flavor, rich. Sorry. And yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay, good. Oh, sorry. We're getting not, some not, good not, feedback here. Not feedback on my mic. Good. Okay. No, no, no. Very smooth, clean good. taste. Excellent flavor, rich and full body, quality lager. The first yeah. sips are going down well. So people yeah, are yeah. enjoying it. And Bob <laughs> says you nailed it. Oh, thanks, Bob. That's great. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's, uh, anyways, so cheers. Um, uh, one soon in the grocery store, hopefully. That's what we're going for first. So. Um, all right, so I think the next beer we're going to be tasting uh, is the Hasta la Vista Black Lager, the Schwartz beer. So, Michelle, were you going to say anything about this or should I just roll straight into it? Yeah, I know it's, um, nope, you go right ahead. This is the beer that we're looking for. It's in the uh, gray can. Perfect. Yeah, that, that's the beer there. <clears throat> <clears throat> All right, so um, this is uh, one of our latest freestyle series. Um, we've been on a run of making dark beers this winter, uh, and this one was a real pleasure to make. Um, a Schwartz beer, or in what are commonly known as a black lager, is a, is a German style beer that, um, you know, lagers typically aren't heavy. Um, they're relatively easy drinking when, I mean, it, lagers can be many different things. Uh, there are heavier lagers, but generally speaking, when you compare ales and lagers, you get lagers tend to be lighter. So it still is, um, it's still a lighter beer, but it has some dark malts, uh, which I'll explain in a second, to give it um, this beautiful dark uh, color and uh, a little bit of a little bit of coffee, uh, chocolate, um, and maybe a tiny bit of licorice, just a hair. Um, so this beer, um, this is probably, you know, I have probably in the top ten beers that I'm most proud of. Um, this is I did go full German on this one, so I actually used 100% German malt in this. Um, and if you believe it or not, uh, the malts, even though they perform the same function, uh, they do have different characteristics depending where they come from. So, uh, in the case of uh, a German, or what we call our base malts, uh, the malt of the barley that makes up, in most beers, anywhere from 80 to 100% of the barley that goes into a beer. Um, it's, it's light, it's straw colored, uh, not a ton of, ton of character compared to some of the darker malts. Um, but it, if you tasted those side by side, uh, you would definitely notice a difference. Um, so I really wanted to go as authentic as I could with this beer. So I did use 100% German barley in this. Um, and what gives it that, that dark color is a, is, a, is a kind of roasted barley. So barley, malted barley is, they take the, the raw barley, they steep it in water, it begins to grow, it begins to sprout, and they stop that sprouting uh, by kiln drying it. They kiln dry at really, really low temperatures uh, to create that light colored barley that we use to produce sugars for the beer. But once you get into darker beers, like in the case of this sports beer or uh, any stout or amber beer or anything like that, um, what you have um, is it, they're processing the barley, they're kilning it to a much higher temperature. They start generating color and flavors. So uh, it can be anywhere from kind of just like a cookie uh, to caramel to raisin, all the way up to coffee, chocolate, burnt, acrid, character, depending on how hot they, how long and how hot they get that kiln. In the case of the Schwartz beer, there's, there's, uh, there's a, a, a roasted German barley uh, malt in this, uh, to give it this, this color, uh, which has that kind of coffee and chocolate character. It's really, really beautiful. Um, and which is actually 
fast becoming one of my favorites. So I just use it in an order chocolate brown ale, which is coming out uh, in a couple of, in about a week or so. Um, so yeah, uh, this is coming also as a full time. It was so popular. We're going to be bringing this one back full time. So uh, enjoy. Awesome. Thank you, Chris. Um, so we know that you guys probably are getting a little ready for snack. Uh, we want to pace out the beers. Tasting six beers in an hour can be uh, quite the feat. So um, we're going to do a bit of a charcuterie board uh, assembly at this point. So we put in some ingredients uh, for the charcuterie board for you guys. Um, and we're also going to do a bit of a contest. So we, Christine's gonna show you guys how to kind of best assemble your charcuterie board. And then if you um, take a photo of the charcuterie board and you hashtag both um, the sweet life, which is uh, Christine's hashtag, and then as well as community craft box, um, whoever has the best looking board will get a free box in March. So I will add, uh, pass this over to you, Christine. Thanks, Michelle. So welcome, thanks everybody for joining us tonight. As Michelle mentioned, I am a hospitality professional, I'm a baker and I'm a world traveler. Uh, and I am loving sharing all of my travel adventures, my entertaining tips and all of my recipes on my, my blog called The Sweet Life. So feel free to follow along on christinecrop.com. So tonight we're going to uh, talk charcuterie boards. I'm gonna give you five tips to easily uh, make your charcuterie board with all of the great ingredients that Michelle has put into your craft box. Then we're going to move on and make a uh, sun-dried tomato and olive tamponade. And we'll finish up the night with some pickling jalapenos. So starting with our charcuterie board, for those that did bring a board or have a board at home, we want to have our board ready and we want to have all of our ingredients out on our counter ready to go along. So as Michelle mentioned, we would love to see your creations at the, uh, during the evening before you start nibbling and uh, certainly show them on social media to show us what you've done and the prize that Michelle had mentioned. So we've got all of our ingredients. We have uh, the hot mama's red pepper jelly. We have some full moon olives. We have a great brie. We have the great Canadian salami. Uh, we talked about the almonds and we have some crackers. <clears throat> so I've asked, I've added a couple of extras. Uh, I love to have all uh, grapes on my charcuterie board. And I added another cheddar cheese because that's one of my favorites when I'm doing charcuterie board. So the big thing to start with is always start with your big items. So you have your charcuterie board. Uh, you have this whole piece of cheese, the brie we'll put there. Um, I always start my focus point with my grapes. A great thing with grapes is to snip them into little parcels. As you can see, they're all falling off my board. Um, but especially times like this when we're sharing boards and we want it easy for people to pick up, um, just take a few little snips and then your guests or spouse can just be picking away at their olives instead of pulling them all off of the board. So we'll put our, all of the, our uh, grapes there. We have our big piece of brie. So brie, you can slice if you wanted, you could wedge it out if you wanted, or you can leave it whole and add some um, knives for your guests to do that. From there, you wanna look at any other dips or condiments that you would be adding to your board. We would add those on. Um, any mid-sized pieces. So we do have our salami. I have cut the salami in just a nice size piece. And we're just going to, and they're great to be able to move, make them into different shapes. Again, easy. You wanna keep any type of salami and meats to the edge of your board. Again, noticing easy access wherever we can grab those items. After we've had that, you can add veggies, you could add crackers, uh, some people to fill space. We might wanna put our crackers right on the board. You can always add a basket after as well. Uh, we have our great olives and these olives stuffed with jalapenos. So we'll add those to the board. You kind of want to work with your design. You know, the rule of thumb in design is threes, everything in three. So kind of keeping that in mind. If you have little pockets, 
you can fill those up with cube cheese. If you have a big board, you want to leave your cheese out in blocks. Lots of different ways that you can add that. And then certainly we have this wonderful bag of mixed nuts. So you can always sprinkle those in, put those in in areas that can fill up little pockets. And then we have our wonderful hot pepper jelly. I think that is amazing on brie. So I would just use my fork and gel that up a little bit. I would put it right on. Again, these kinds of condiments could be put on the side, but I think it's great if you would just put it right on the cheese, add your knives, your crackers are there, we're ready to go. So in a quick five minute steps, you have your charcuterie board. So I'm very excited to see how everybody has done with their charcuterie boards. Perfect, thank you. And I'm sure everyone's anxious to have a, a little bite. So thank you very much, uh, Christine. So um, hopefully that gives you guys a chance to kind of catch up with the first two beers. Um, Chris, I will hand it back over to you and we're gonna taste the next beer, which I think is the American Pale Ale. All right there. Sorry about that. Yes. Um, so uh, this is what I like to call my first love. This is, uh, uh, this is uh, our downhill pale ale, um, named obviously after the abundance of uh, ski hills uh, here in Collingwood. Um, so this is this is the first beer uh, that we ever released, um, and uh, it's a bit of a for me. It's uh, set, a bit sentimental about it. But at Niagara College, uh, the final project for my graduation, I had to, uh, basically they get you just to design a beer and brew it all the way start to finish. Um, uh, and so my, pro my project was to design the beer that was gonna become the flagship beer of the brewery that I would eventually open in Collingwood one day. Um, so, that, so that is this beer, uh, this downhill pale ale. Um, so there's probably about, 10 to 15 iterations of it that I made uh, starting at the college and then at home uh, before I finally got to make uh, 3,000 liters of it here uh, the first time. So um, so it is near and dear to my heart um, and it is still our number one seller. So uh, the style is American Pale Ale um, and what denotes an American Pale Ale uh, from what would be, I guess, uh, the original style of British Pale Ale is just the type of hops that are used. Um, so the uh the uh the hops are american most traditional hop the, the original i want to say original american pale ale sierra nevada really feature the cascade hop which is known for its citrus its grapefruit character um and that is kind of uh, the original american pale ale uh, but so american pale ales tend to be fruitier citrus more citrus more pine that kind of thing whereas british pale ales tend to be a little maltier um and british hops tend to be a little earthier more floral so um, you know, that, that, that is historically, I'm sure now in Britain, they're making all sorts of crazy beers too. But um, so my, this beer kind of falls, I call it American Pale Ale because I am using American hops in it. Uh, and the one there's Cascade in it, but the one that really dominates is a hop called Amarillo. Um, and uh, it was kind of one of the first, um, kind of it, at the, it was kind of the tip of the spear with when the Americans were, crossbreeding all sorts of hops to get crazy flavors and aromas and all sorts of things. So it was kind of one of these new super hops that came out years ago. Um, and it's like a super cascade. So instead of being grapefruity, it's a little more orange and honeysuckle, uh, but it still has that grapefruit character. Um, so one of my favorite hops to use. Even now, now it's not that exciting uh, relative to all the new crazy stuff. Uh, just, just a note on hops. Um, so hops, as, as I'm talking about them, obviously give our beer aroma and flavor. It also, they also give us uh, its bittering qualities, which you feel in the back of your tongue after you swallow. So it's very important not to spit your beer out like you do when you're drinking wine. Uh, you do have to swallow it. Um, and you, to get a proper sense of the bitterness of a beer, you have to drink the whole thing because the bitterness actually is in the back of your tongue. Uh, so that's important. It's hard to get a the sense of a beer with just taking a couple of sips. Um, hops are a, it's a kind of uh, both vine uh, or, or what goes on a vine. Um, and they're little green cones. I don't have any here to show you, but uh, they're grown all around the world and, and kind of, but they're very sensitive and they have to be they're grown. They're sensitive like grapes. So uh, there are certain growing regions around the world. Famous ones would be in the south of England, uh, 
in Germany and Tetang, uh, on the West Coast, United States as well, in Yakima Valley. Um, lots of incredible hops coming out of there. Uh, New Zealand and Australia now also making absolutely unbelievable hops. Um, so in the case of the Amarillo, is an American hop from, uh, from the West Coast. So, um, so these hops are grown. Uh, they grow really quickly over about two or three months, and then they get harvested uh, over about a probably a two-week period. Then they, they get kiln dried and pelletized and they get packaged and stored so you can, you can use them all year long. Um, so, uh, so like I said, the hops give the beers bittering properties um, and the aromatics and flavor as well. Um, so in the case of downhill, we'll get back to this beer. Um, this uh, features, like I said, the Amarillo hop. Um, I, do, I do get the, the definitely the orange. Uh, a little bit of grapefruit, tiny bit of honey. Um, and as far as uh, American, the style goes, American pale ales, I wouldn't say this beer ex is exactly to this to style. Uh, it is got a little bit more malt character in it um, than your average uh, American pale ale. So it's a little more robust and flavorful, uh, but it's just, uh, I like it. And I think that that, that malt character really backs up uh, the orange and citrus uh, in this beer. So. Uh, and the last thing I'll do, I'm just going to show you guys. This beer has gone through a few changes. So this is our, I don't know if you can see it. There it is. Our very first can uh, of downhill we did originally when we were just four guys making a brewery and had no idea what we were doing. Um, and we turned it into this can. Um, a little bit better, a little clearer, and then finally to the can that you uh, you have in your hands now. So a little bit cleaner. And that's a fresh, that, that rebrand is very, very fresh uh, this year. Uh, we're still kind of rolling it out a little bit through COVID. It's a bit tough, but uh, yeah, I've got a, a fresh new look these days. So trying to stay current. So anyways, cheers, everybody. Awesome. Cheers. Thank you. Chris, I would love to hear more. So you've got the, um, the, the freestyle and then you've got, so is that like a collection itself? Yeah, the freestyle series. Um, so I, like I'll just say the, the downhill is our flagship. So it's available everywhere. So it's across the province in the LCBO. Um, freestyle series is our one-off series. Uh, we were fortunate enough to launch it at the LCBO um, last summer. So the last summer was our first, uh, the first time we sent that to the LCBO. And so at the LCBO, it's quarterly. Um, so every, every season you'll get a new one. So right now we have our uh, Il Vanilla Stout uh, uh, on shelf and we're gonna be rolling out a big IPA uh, in the spring and then a Key Lime Sour in the summer. So, so we have this this freestyle series at the LCBO, and and that will and that has like the full right. So um, we do our one-off uh, freestyle series here on a more I want to say like when we're running full tilt and we're not in a lockdown, uh, we're probably releasing a new beer every three to four weeks. We're releasing um, uh, a brand new beer, and that's why they're on these silver cans because it's such a small run uh, of beer. Uh, we we don't get, we don't go to the big production of cans, but we. Uh, we'd, when you and, say a small run, like how many, what kind of run would you do? Uh, we'd probably, we'll get anywhere from four to 5,000 cans um, and, you know, 40 or 50 eggs of it. So it's the 3,500 liters is our batch size. So that's, that's the model. Okay. So our, our typical batch size, like when, when I fill my tanks, they're each, they're each 7,000 liters. Um, so yeah. when, I, when, I, when I'm producing the beers that are going out to the LCBO and the beer store and the grocery store, that's why I'm making much larger volume. Very cool. Well, it sounds like people uh, love the the first one that you showed us, the classic. So maybe you should bring that back for an anniversary or something. Uh, you know, I know it's, it's, I do like it, but okay. So here you go. Guys, we didn't know anything about branding um, or the LCBO. So I, I think you can see it there. So it looks great. I love the ski hill. I love the chairlift, but most cans at the LCBO sit in a tray. And when the tray, the tray will do that. So you have no idea what this beer is when you see it on the shelf at the LCBO. So that was like, we had, someone had to tell us that after we designed the can. So live and learn, right? So that's why we changed it to that. <laughs> so you can actually see what the beer is when it's sitting on the shelf. So these are things that if you don't know about marketing and branding, you just, you just don't know. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. Well, it's all part of the learning curve, right? So for sure, yeah, for maybe sure. you should bring it back for an, an, a classic anniversary or something like that. I, so. I would, I've, I've thought about it. Yeah. 
Um, okay, so I will uh, pass it back over to Christine. Um, we wanted to give you guys a few other ideas of things that you can um, add to your charcuterie board that you can make at home. And we had uh, lots and lots of ideas, but we have a short period of time. So what we wanted to walk you through tonight was to do a sun-dried tomato tapenade. So in your box, um, you should have the sun-dried tomatoes, uh, the olives, and, um, and all the ingredients that you need to make the tapenade. So I will pass it over to Christine to walk us through how to do it. Thanks, Michelle. So our sun-dried tomato and olive tapenade. So as Michelle mentioned, you had two olives in your box. We took the full moon hot olives and we use those on the charcuterie board. They were the ones that were stuffed with jalapeno peppers. So in this one, we are using the garlic stuffed olives. And that's awesome because we would be crushing garlic into this recipe. So we're gonna go with the regular um, garlic stuffed olives, cut two steps into that. So it's a pretty simple, easy recipe. I am using a Cuisinart chopper. Um, you could do it by hand if you like to chop and chop all of the ingredients. It's a really rough chop. Uh, it's a chunky, it's almost like a pochetta, so very chunky. Um, we're going to start with actually the whole jar of olives, which is one cup of olives. Then we're going to add our sun-dried tomatoes. So it's about a third of a jar, maybe just about a half of a jar. Uh, so it's a third of a cup is what we're adding, and we are adding the olive oil from the tomatoes as well. So quick and easy putting everything on in. We had some fresh basil in our box. So we're going to put in um, quite a few leaves, probably 10 or so basil leaves depending on the size. So it works out about two and a half uh, tablespoons of basil. And then you also had a lemon. So we've cut the lemon in half. We need uh, an, only a tablespoon of lemon juice. I have this great little um, juicer. So I'm going to juice it right into my little cup. Juicing lemons, kind of fun. If you had to do it by hand, certainly can juice it right into your hand as you wanna make sure you catch all of those pits. You don't want pits in your tamponade. So I'm gonna put the juice of the entire one lemon, sorry, into, and that's it, simple. I'm gonna put that onto my chopper. Excuse me for a moment while I make some noise. And we're, oh, not too bad. We're just going to slightly pulse this up. Again, we'd like a nice, chunky tamponade. Tamponades are usually on a crusty bread, on a cracker. So we don't, it's not a spread. It's really, it's those little basil leaves, I think, that take up. So we've just chopped it all up. So if you're last minute, need a quick appetizer snack, something to go, you're hungry, this would be a very healthy uh, snack as well. Um, we're done. Olives and sun-dried tomatoes, a little bit of garlic, some basil. And trying to see where the best way to see this, very nice uh, chunky tamponade. So just grab a cracker from your charcuterie board, nice piece of crostini, nice and thick, love it. Cheers. Awesome, thank you. So we tried to make it a little bit easier for you guys by removing a few uh, steps. So normally you would have to chop off the garlic and whatnot, but uh, so we included the garlic and the olives just to make it a little bit easier. Um, and so hopefully people are enjoying that. So I'm going to pass it back to you, Chris, and um, we're going to, we've got two more beers, I think, to taste, and we also have um, a giveaway that I'm really excited about, so. Beauty. All right. Yeah. Uh, I think we have th three more beers, I believe. Uh, to go. Yeah. Um, sorry. My mistake. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I just want to make sure I'm not off, I'm not off track here. Uh, all right. So um, the next beer is our, uh, our, it's our wet hop. Uh, pale ale. So, um, there we go. 
so uh, let's talk uh, a little bit more about hops uh, in, as it relates to this beer. Um, so two things to note. Um, if, uh, do you guys, if any of you are big IPA drinkers and know anything about uh, the process of uh, making IPAs or even some, some other beers as well, um, there, you, you'll often see the, the term dry hop. Uh, I've, it'll appear on cans and, and products and, and, and lingo as, uh, if you're familiar with it. So um, dry hopping is a process uh, where um, once the beer is, once you're, you've actually fermented uh, your wort into beer, um, you have the beer in the tank, uh, the process of dry hopping is adding more hops uh, into that fermented beer. So you already have the beer, and you're putting more hops in. Uh, typically, you, you um, usually put the hops, I mean, you, you do put the hops in on the, what we call the hot side of brewing, where we're boiling and producing that sugary wort, that the yeast um, in, in the beer. Um, so we add hops during the boil to bitter the beer, uh, and then we add hops at the end of the boil to steep in that wort, and, and it almost acts like a tea, where a, then you're just getting those aromatics and flavors out of the hops. Um, even that character is different uh, from if you, if you put the hop in the boil at the end, uh, or sorry, a hop in the kettle at the end of your boiling, uh, if I put Amarillo there, but then if I took Amarillo and I put it in the tank after, the character that you'll get from that hop will be different. Um, you use a much rawer, coarser, um, more intense hop character when you dry hop. So, um, so now what we're talking about in the case of wet hopping, and this beer is hop beer. Um, it's a bit of a misnomer. Uh, what we're really talking about is fresh hop. So if you, if you remember before I mentioned that hops are grown uh, over a three-month period thereabouts and they're harvested um, and uh, kiln dried for use throughout the year. Uh, but during those two weeks brewers actually get to use them fresh out of the field uh, and they have a very different character because um, when you kiln, kiln dry them they break down some of those oils and the character of the hops changes. Uh, so you get to use them fresh out of the field um, and they're, they're wet in the sense that they still have all the water in them, so they're not kiln dry. So that's when we talk about wet hopped beers or wet hopped whatever, that's what we're talking about. It's not, it's not a process um, in the brewing uh, while you're making the beer, it's, it's actually about those hops, fresh, the fresh hops. Out. So that's what this is. So there, there's a hop farm, um, it's about half an hour from here in Meaford. A uh, good friend of mine, Nicholas, uh, he, uh, I've been using him for some seasonals for as long as we've been open. Um, and he grows this incredible Chinook hop. Uh, so this year uh, he called me up and he, and he asked me if I was going to do a wet hop beer and wanted to use fresh hops. And I said, that's a great idea because I hadn't done one for a couple of years. So uh, I drove up to his farm. He literally is running the binds through his, I got to say this right, Alpenflucker, I think is what it's called. It's this giant machine from the 70s that strips all the hop bones uh, off the vine. Uh, and then I basically had like three or four uh, yard yard bags full of these fresh hops uh, in my van and uh, it was a wonderful drive back to the brewery because it smelled incredible um, and I put all of those straight into my brew um, so uh, it's just it's it's a bit of a pain in the ass to make these kinds of beers but the payoff is really nice uh, I really like them so uh, this beer was made back in the fall and it's standing up really well um, so as you can see it's kind of a it's an amber amber pale ale it's a very very simple pale ale uh, I, just, I just really wanted to let the hop come through um, so, um, so I think Chinook, the, the, the Chinook always, it always smells, I don't know if anyone ever buys Scotch pine Christmas trees anymore. Uh, those long needles that really, are really pointy at Christmas time. Um, that's what I really get out of this hop. Uh, I also find this beer a little bit perfumey. Um, but, uh, it's just, uh, it's a wonderful, intense, uh, Kind of fruity, mildly sprucey character uh, to this beer. So, um, and it has a really dry, bitter finish. So, it turned out to be a really, really nice British style uh, pale ale. So, um, so yeah. we're, we're so. getting some good feedback here. Um, a bit of a woody flavor, excellent, excellent citrus. I also just want to confirm that for because a few of you guys are getting a little lost, that this is the beer <laughs> that we're on. Um, yeah. And Greg says this is his favorite so far. So we are oh, on the wet hop, which is yeah. uh, this one here in the red. Perfect. Yeah, I, I used to I used to make uh, I had a beer that I made for a few years called our vintage ale. Um, it was in a bright yellow can, and it was uh, local honey and fresh hops, and it was really popular um, uh, with a few people. <laughs> but, 
uh, I just got out and just decided to move on to something else. But I'm really glad I got to do this uh, this beer. Um, unfortunately, Nicholas is shut down. He's not growing his hops anymore. It's, this year was his last year, so this is my last chance. To do it. So I'm really glad I got to do it. So, anyways, cheers, everyone. Enjoy. Sure. So this is special. So this may not it is. happen yeah. then in the future. Then. Uh, well, no, with Nicholas. If I can find some Chinook that is is uh, is as good as this, I, I might do it again. So uh, there is another. There's a there's a hop farm, a Stones Throw, uh, from us, um, which uh, I'm actually using their hops in our upcoming spring, our, our tropical IPA. Um, it's coming out in a in a couple weeks. So it's and they have, their their hops are really nice as well. Uh, Brian and Shelby are asking if you've considered doing a double dry hopped. Uh, yeah, I mean. To be honest, it's uh, du double dry hop. Is it? I mean, it's it. It's a bit of a. It's it's just it's just to indicate the, the the manner in which you dry hop and the intensity to which you dry hop. So, for all intents and purposes, um, the I don't think we have the new. We're not tasting our New England IPA. That was double dry hopped. So the, my trop is called Thunder, uh, which is fermenting. It's dry hopped right now. It's double dry hopped as well. So there's there are two separate editions, um, uh, two stages of fermentation. Um, so, so it's coming. So I guess, I guess the short answer is yes. It'll be out in a couple of weeks. All right. I'm just going to recap because I know um, just so we're all on the same page. So, so far we've tasted the first one that we tasted was the Sunset Point. Uh, the second one was the Hostel La Vista and the Great Grey Can. And then we had um, the American Pale Ale, which was the downhill. Um, and then we just tasted the wet hop. Um, so we're going to do a quick contest, um, which you have, which I'm really excited about our giveaway. So I'll let you, I'll let you tell us about it, Chris. Okay. Um, so, uh, the giveaway for this, uh, this is going to be a, a two part trivia, um, is, uh, a pair of snowshoes, uh, and a 12 pack, um, for, for, First, this is basically for the first person who can get their answer into the chat, okay? Um, so this is a bit of a mm, semi-nerdy beer question. Um, so the question is, what is, sorry, I'm gonna start that again so I get this right, so I don't confuse anyone. Um, um, what is the Rheinheitsgebot more commonly known as in English and what does it mean? What is the Rheinheitsgebot? No, more, known more commonly as in English, and what does it mean? So I honestly don't know the answer. <laughs> We've got a uh, beer glass, lager, oh. boot-shaped glass, Bavarian. Bob, Bob, got, Bob got it. Bob got it. All right. B Bob, can you can you expand on the? Am I allowed to talk to Bob? Bob, yeah, can of you, course. Do you yeah. Know what? It is, in fact, uh, what are the four ingredients, Bob? <laughs> oh, Bob, you're muted. Here, there we go. Uh, water, malt, hops, and uh, did you say water already? Yeah. Oh, you well, you know, yeah, so I'll stop you there because it's actually only three ingredients because they didn't know about okay. this. Right, that was before uh, Louis Pasteur discovered it. Um, so you're correct about that. It's uh, malted uh, barley, uh, water, and hops that they could only brew. Only beer could only be brewed using that. So that was right. fifteen something, fifteen eighty three or something like Fif that. Fifteen something, and I think if if I'm if memory serves, it was actually more of a political uh, declaration because the uh, the aristocracy wanted the monopoly on making That's wheat right. beer. So they didn't want anyone else to make wheat beer. So they said, this is the law for all you people, but we get to make the wheat beers. So there you go. Anyways, good awesome. on you. Congratulations. Thanks. Bob, Appreciate you want yeah, some snowshoes, which is really exciting. And those are hot commodities right now in COVID. Those are not easy to find. So that's a great <laughs> prize, uh, right. Chris. So thank you very much. Yeah, no <laughs> problem. So we'll connect. Yeah, thanks, everyone. We'll get, get that sent out to you. And um, just with regards to the board photos, so we want you guys to post your photos on social. Be sure to tag us at, um, tag us on Instagram, Community Craft Beer Festival, and then put the hashtag, the Sweet Life Community Craft Box. So that's how we will announce the winner and we'll announce the winner on social for those of you. 
Okay, so I think we are on to the next one, which is the Strawberry Milkshake IPA. Correct, yes. I believe this is the last can of it. We don't have any more cans, so I'm grabbing the, uh, something off tap for it. But we're totally sold out of this. It's excellent. Um, so, um, yeah, so this, this beer was our uh, second freestyle offering at the LCBO. Uh, it was uh, for the, the fall. Bron yeah, it was a bronze medal winner at the Canadian Brewing Awards. So, um, we are there. Cheers, everyone. So, um, so what, what is a milkshake IPA? Um, so, a milkshake, it's a, it's a derivative of a relatively new style of IPAs uh, called uh, New England IPAs, um, which tend to be very, 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 very hazy, often opaque, uh, depending on how, how the brewery makes it. So you've seen all the hazy beers, the hazy craze. Um, that uh, that is all that was all kind of started uh, by this this style uh, this New England IPA. So what makes a New England IPA different from like a traditional West Coast American IPA uh, would be that it is not just you know, I like a hazy beer, but a lot of them are just like opaque. They look like like smoothies or whatever. Um, the, the yeast strain that they're using um, is very very fruity. So it's originally, it's a, it's a British style ale yeast, uh, which produces a lot more fruity aromas than a clean American ale yeast does. Um, and then the other thing about the yeast is that uh, it's, it's uh, there's, there's a term we use in brewing called flocculation. And that's a degree, that, that is the degree to which uh, a yeast, once it is finished fermenting the beer, uh, it, it, it settles to the bottom of the beer and the beer clears up, it becomes clear. Um, so if it's high flocculating, drops out, you get clear beer. If it's low flocculating, it stays in suspension and you have a really hazy, cloudy beer. So, uh, so those, those milkshake beers are made with uh, low flocculating. That's the meaning of the IPAs. So they're very hazy. And brewers will go through, uh, brewers will go through all sorts of things uh, to keep that beer hazy. They may use flour in it, um, all sorts of things to try and keep it really, really hazy. So. Um, to be honest, I was never that intent on making my beer intensely hazy. So depending to the degree to which you agitated uh, your can of strawberry milkshake IPA, it will be hazier or less hazy. So it, it, does, it does all beers settle out over time. Clear up. So um, you can see mine, which is poured off tap. It starts as our very last keg and the very end of it. So it is, it is pretty clear. Um, when you oh, say it's your very last keg, a few people are saying, wait, you have no more of this? No, there's no more. This no. seems <laughs> to be a favorite so far. <laughs> there's no more, I'm afraid. Um, so there's, it, it is still on some LCBO shelves, but we don't have any here at the brewery. So, um, so uh, this draw, so the milkshake IPA uh, is uh, a variation of the New England IPA, and that's where you add lactose to the beer. Um, so uh, lactose is a sugar that you can add that doesn't ferment. So when you, when you make a beer and you produce your wort, you have sugar and uh, maybe 75 to 85% of it can actually be fermented into alcohol uh, and CO2 by the yeast. Uh, but if you add lactose to it, uh, the lactose is unfermentable. It'll stay in the finished product, so it'll have that residual sweetness. So you, may, you may notice a little, bit of, a little bit more sweetness on this beer um, than, than some of the other ones or some of the other IPAs. So. Anyway. Which yeah, I think is definitely there. Um, well, this is just, it's a straight up, but besides that, it's a straight up really good IPA with featuring uh, Cinco hops and Mosaic, two amazing uh, aromatic American hops. Um, and the strawberry, it's a wild strawberry uh, flavoring. I didn't go for the actual fruit in this case. Um, strawberry, using strawberry fruit in beer is very challenging. Uh, it doesn't really last very long. The flavor components don't last very long in the beer. So um, I often do go for strawberry, uh, and that kind of lends it uh, this very kind of pretty British like, character from that, that British ale yeast I was talking about. So uh, it was, this was a, uh, this is one of the very first freestyle series beers that we did. Um, and it was trying to come up with the craziest thing that we could think of kind of in the moment. Um, and uh, the first time we did it, then we just like we sold out of it like gangbusters a couple years ago. So we decided to bring it back 
uh, as one of the first uh, freestyles at the, at the LCD. Uh, people really do like it. It's like for me, it's it's a bit honestly, it's a bit gimmicky, but it's a really solid IPA and a pretty, pretty good beer. So. Awesome, sounds good. Seems to be. I think people want you to make this a regular, so <laughs> <laughs> you'll have to give that some thought. Sure. All right, Christine. Um, we are going to make some pickled jalapenos, and actually, you can pickle just about anything in your fridge really like I use the same recipe for cucumbers and radishes and all kinds of stuff so uh and it goes really well with the board so I will pass it over to you. Thanks Michelle. Yeah, I love pickling um red onions so yeah absolutely it's amazing what you can do and um you know you wonder what can you do with pickled jalapenos there's many things with you know your Mexican food your tacos adding it to guacamole you can put them into chili. So there's lots of things um, to be done with pickled jalapenos. So for those following along, uh, we've used the large jalapenos here. We've sliced them, um, you know, an eighth of an inch, some, some nice slices, uh, totally up to you. This jar, 500 ml jar, I actually did uh, four large um, jalapenos. So it doesn't take much at all. Um, the best part is your pickling liquid. And I did use the Collingwood uh, Downhill IPA. Tastes great, but even better uh, with our pickling liquid here. So in my pot, I have boiled off some IPA, some apple cider vinegar, a little bit of sugar and some salt and peppercorns. I uh, brought it to a boil and I've let to the sugar and the salt, everything um, has melted. And pretty simple, add all of your jalapenos to the jar and pour your hot pickling liquid right over top filling the jar. Christine, how long do you need to boil that mixture for? You know, honestly, it didn't take long to boil and it was probably maybe five minutes, but it's really just to get the sugar to melt that you're looking for um, so that it's a clear liquid. And then the peppercorns stay right in it. It gets part of your pickling um, liquid afterwards as well. And then from there, you just want to, just like any type of canning, you want a good seal on that. It should sit in the fridge 24 hours to get some really good flavor. Uh, longer certainly is better and it will keep in the fridge at least six months. So uh, quite a while that you can keep these lovelies pickled in your fridge. And you don't need to actually like um, seal the can. You can just keep it in the fridge. No. For six months. Right. Yeah, exactly. So I, you know, I've used a full I know, but you could use any jar. Um, these are certainly great jars. And I you, like wide mouth jars mainly because when you're pouring the liquid in, you have lots of space to pour it all over the camera. I made mine a week ago and then I've been sort of slowly testing it as the week goes on. I love Oh, that's a great idea. Pickled, but uh, it seems to be getting better by the day. So super okay. easy. It literally took like right. five minutes to make this recipe. So. And I awesome. think, uh, I mean, it goes well with the, the cheese and the meat on the board as well. Well, and it's awesome to have the beer in it. I love making things. I do a lot of baking with the dark beers, uh, but certainly great gifts. So if you are going somewhere and you don't want to, uh, you could certainly just add a little ribbon to that and off you go. All right, uh, Chris, back to you. We've got the white IPA, which is the final beer that we're going to uh, taste today. So I'll hand that over to you. All right, great. Okay. Here we are. All right, so this is, um, White IPA is a, uh, it's a, a hybrid style between uh, a Belgian wit beer um, uh, and American style IPA. So we've taken these, these two things and, and basically put them together. So uh, what makes a, Bel a Belgian wit beer um, is one, the, the, the fruity Belgian yeast strain, um, uh, which gives you that kind of typical banana and clove character that you might get even in German wheat beers, it's all depending on, on, the, on, the, on the brewery and the strain that you think. Um, uh, so if you think common examples of wit beers would be Hogarden. Garden, uh, would be one of them. Um, uh, what's the one from Quebec? Uh, I can't think of it now. Anyway, there's one from Quebec from uh, Unibrew uh, as well. Even the Mill Street Wit beer as well. Uh, that's an example. So, um, 
uh, and then the other part of it is the traditional use of orange peel, sweet orange peel, or bitter orange peel, uh, and coriander. So I launched a Chambly, yes, that's the one, thank you. Um, so, uh, which is a phenomenal beer. So uh, in, in this case, it's, um, so I have have used orange peel and coriander in this, uh, but I brewed it instead of, uh, you know, a four to 5% beer, I've made it 6%, so up in IPA territory in terms of the alcohol. Uh, and then I've added some big, big, juicy American hops. Um, favorite Amarillo, but uh, cashmere and Azaka, which are um, you know, kind of all around tropical sweet white hops. Really, really nice. So, um, so anyways, give it a try. I, I definitely get uh, some of that Belgian yeast spice, uh, kind of that clove, a little bit of banana, but still also really like coriander as well. Honestly, I haven't had this beer for a while. I tried it this afternoon in, in anticipation of this. Um, and I think it's really great. And I'm really enjoying it. Um, so, uh, and this is, uh, so I did use a, a, a Belgian yeast strain. Um, we did, a, we have another brewery here in town, Black Fellows. Uh, they're kind of buddies of mine. Um, and they, they started, when they first opened, they were doing Belgian beers. We did a collaboration beer together uh, this past summer. Uh, so I brought their, their Belgian yeast strain into the brewery to make that beer uh, and then I kind of went on a string of making a bunch of Belgian beers uh, with their yeast. So I did uh, a traditional whipped beer, I did a whipped beer with uh, uh, chamomile um, and then the last one I did was white IPA. So it was a real treat to get to make all those beers uh, with their yeast strain. So the next one I'll actually be using their yeast strain for is our key lime sour which is coming out in the summer. So it's, uh, it's a yeast beer uh, made with uh, key lime juice make it very, very tart. So watch for that this summer. Yeah. So anyways. Awesome. Sounds good. Cheers. Thank you very much. So I just want to tell you guys about um, a few things coming up. So we have our March uh, box coming up. Actually, all of our boxes until uh, June are live right now. We've got a March box, which, which is with uh, Prince Eddie Brewing in Prince Edward County. So we're really excited about that. In April, we're working with Henderson Brewery, which is in the west end of uh, Toronto. And then May, uh, just in time for sort of May 2-4 uh, Victoria Day weekend, we're going to do a mix pack. There won't be any tastings over the summer um, because we're sure you guys will be ready to spend some time uh, outside your backyards and on the dock and in the lake and, and not as much time looking at Zoom, but we'll still keep doing the boxes. So um, May, June, July, and August, uh, we'll have boxes available. May, we've got our mix pack. We've got Old Plain, Flying Monkeys, Black Lab, George, Midtown, Founders. So it's going to be um, a great one. We're also working on a mixology class and a wine tasting, which is coming up and will be announced shortly. So stay tuned for that. Um, we do have a tradition. I ask everyone and those of you that haven't had your cameras on for this evening to give us a toast and a cheers. And I'm going to take a group photo. So uh, hold up your glasses. We've got a few pages here. So I'm going to do page one. Cheers. Awesome. Okay, one more. It's great. I love, I love to see everyone behind their cameras. <laughs> Sorry. Phone, phone issues. One more. Okay, there we go. Perfect. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, thank you very much, Christine. Um, it was awesome having Collingwood Brewery, some really great beers. Love the branding. It's just been such a pleasure working with you guys. And uh, I think you got some really great feedback from your fans. So thank you so much, everyone, for attending the February box. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. And uh, yeah, we will see you guys later. Have a great evening. Thank you. Great night. Thank you.